for the rest of our days until it's time to come home. A home we've never seen, but our spirits grown for it because it has tasted the full completion of salvation. It's our souls that need to be understood and convinced. That's why we struggle and stumble in this world so much. The spirit knows what the truth is, but our souls need to be constantly convinced. How else do we get to such famous passages as Romans, Romans 12? How do we get to these famous passages? If not, we have to remind ourselves that we too still fall short. We're not there. The Spirit's there, but we're not. Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, be by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but he, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern that the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We got to understand that. Every day, this is an everyday process. Every minute, every second, every every time you fall down, every time you, you go to that, that, that lunch meeting, every time you go to a meeting, every time you come home and get in your car, talk to your kids, talk to yourself, lay down and wake up. You got to remind yourself. I got to keep reminding myself. That I am a child of God and God has not forsaken us. God has never forsaken us. If God forsaken us, there'd be no there'd be no need for Christ. The fact that Christ exists and came to us and is there for those who legitimately cry for help shows that God has not forsaken this world. Though the world may be falling apart, the people in it can still be saved. Why else do we have the gospel? Why else do we have the gospel if there was no if, if, if there wasn't hope for those people like me, people like you, people that are listening today, for those who don't have hope that cling to this world for every bit of whatever they think can look like hope. But it's not hope what the world supplies. It's distraction. The world can only dis- can prescribe distraction. It can only give you medicines to cover up symptoms, but the root problem of man never goes away because the world can't address it. There's nothing made by human hands that can solve the problem of the human condition. Not science, not medicine, not psychology. It is simply Jesus Christ. God, the Holy Spirit, the divine God. He is only, the only one who can and has addressed the human condition and has a plan and the plan has been put forth. The plan works. The plan has succeeded. And we have to believe in it. Depression can rob people and and attack them at that belief system. It can attack them hard don't think that doubt is alien to anybody don't think that that doesn't happen it happens it happens a lot more than people think they want to talk about when that that Christians don't get depressed and if we get depressed it must be a problem with the Christian's belief system maybe his faith isn't good Maybe something happened to him to where he's not thinking clearly. Maybe it's his faith that's in question. And maybe it's not anything else but that. That doesn't make any sense, does it? But it does to those who want to sit there and point fingers. And that happens. It happens. And the worst part about it is, is, is that we feed it. Even unknowingly, we help feed those issues. It happens. And it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. I want you I want you to hear what happens when doubt soils itself and how Christ responds to doubt. Let's go to Luke chapter seven. And we're gonna take a look at that. Let's go to Luke chapter seven. And we go we go address this. This is John now. Now we all know that John was there in the beginning. He bad he was there, he was preaching repentance. He was preaching that the Lamb is coming. He was the forerunner. He was the one that made the path made straight for Christ to come. 
No question about those things. These things that have come to be, they are what they are, and that's what it is, right? We all agree with that. So John said, this is, let's go to verse 18. The disciples of John reported all these things to him, and John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Now, we got to look at that on its surface and kind of get it and say, Okay, what, what's going on here? Was this not the same John that. <laughs> let's not, let's not, let's not, let's not, let's not gloss it. Let's look at it. Okay, let's look at it. So, because you know, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be fun if I just tell you about it. Let's read it for ourselves. Much better read it for ourselves than to sit there and assume and think um, all these crazy things. So here we go, Matthew three. So when we see these things. We see John talking about it. Okay, if you just go to John, let's go to Matthew chapter three, chapter three, verse two. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is John the Baptist preaching. For this is he who is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, "The voice of, of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight." All right, we got that. We understand that. John says in verse seven, "But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for the baptism, he said to them, 'You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit in keeping with repentance.'" And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Verse 13, and Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be. So now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when John, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened up to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and come to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. John was aware who Christ was and is. It wasn't a shock to him when he saw this. It wasn't a surprise. It happened. This is who he was. He saw it. He knew who it was. So this can't be a total shock to John for him to send his disciples and say, what do you, is this the Christ? Is this the Christ that is to come? Is this the Christ that is to come? It couldn't have, it couldn't, it couldn't have been a shock to him. You know what I'm saying? This could not be some surprise to John. He was there when it happened. John says in Luke chapter 3, John answered him, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than, than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie, he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Again, he's saying these things. He knows. He knows who it is. But yet we get to verse 7, we go to chapter 7, and we see verse 20. Where he sent his disciples, John sent his disciples, to say, are you the one to come? And shall we look for, or should we look for another? Even John, when he was imprisoned, was starting to have some questions. Was depression setting in? I don't know. But maybe he felt abandoned. Maybe he felt like maybe this was, did I do the right thing? Did I follow in the footsteps as I was supposed to? Look what Jesus did. Look at the look at the beautifulness. In that hour, he this is Jesus Christ. In that hour, he healed many people of diseases, plagues, and evil spirits. And many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. When John messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you get out of into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? When did you go out to see a man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. What 
then did you go see a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. Just amazing that, that Christ not only uplifted John, he confirmed it through John's disciples. Then he went on to tell people, do you see the truth and honesty of John? One gave John some praise, showed people that this is what a man of God looks like. A man that did and is doing the work of God, even when he was inside that jail cell. That even though before when he did the baptism, even though when he did the things that were called upon him from the prophet Isaiah, when he fulfilled God's plan, even John had fell victim to some doubt, but he was not forsaken by God. He was not forsaken by Christ. He was not only encouraged and uplifted, Christ was there for him in his time of need. Much as I have to remind myself and much that I want to remind you, Christ has not left us. We have not reached so much hopelessness that Christ cannot pick us up. There are messengers sent constantly out to remind God's children that you are not forgotten about. You have not been forsaken. You've not been pushed aside. You've not been laid to, to don't say, so God can take care of more important matters than you. You are still vitally important to God. You are one of God's children. You're in his house. He is not a man who can forget who his children are. He is fully cognizant and aware of you at all times. And he makes himself known to you. But we have to open ourselves to him by doing the things that are consistent with hearing and feeling our father wanting to shower us with this knowledge and truth. So we have to ask ourselves, well, Eric, well, how, well, how does God do that? How does God do that? John verse 14, verse 16. And I will ask the father and he will give you another helper, a comforter, an advocate, an intercessor, a counselor, a strengthener, and stand by to be with you forever. The Holy Spirit, God's will incarnate. And let's not just gloss past those words. Let's go into the dictionary and look at these words. You know I love looking at words. It's important. I think it's important that we define it so we can really get to the meat of a situation. So, in this passage in the Amplified Bible, he is a, with the Holy Spirit is described in a number of a number of words. Okay, first word here is a helper, a noun, a person who helps someone else, a person who helps someone else. Pretty simple. A comforter. A noun again, a person that provides consolation. Comfort received by a person after a loss or a disappointment. A person or that's providing comfort to a person who has suffered. Isn't that amazing? I love that word, comfort. A comforter, an advocate. Here's another great word, an advocate. A person who publicly supports and recommends a particular cause or policy or person. A person who pleads on someone else's behalf. I love that, an advocate, someone who publicly defends and advocates for you, supports you. The word support, to bear all part of the weight, to hold up, to produce, to endure, to give assistance, to provide for, to suggest for, to give approval of, to be actively interested in and involved in. Love that, the advocate. The Holy Spirit is all those things. He's involved with us. He supports us. He gives to us. He holds us up. He bears the weight for us. He stands with us. Intercessor. You hear that a lot? I need in prayer intercessory. A person who intervenes on the behalf of another. Especially by prayer. Intervene. Come between. So that as to prevent an alter a result or course of events. To interrupt. To interpose and, be, and, and, and delay something from coming. 
to place an obstacle in front of so something does not hit you. I love that description of the Holy Spirit. All of them, but look at that. To come between to prevent a result that might have seemed inevitable. That's powerful. That is powerful. Can't get past that one. A counselor. A counselor. A person trained to give guidance, personal, social, or psychological problems. I like that. A person who supervises. A person who looks after and advises with good and great wisdom. To give guidance, advice, information aimed at resolving a problem or difficulty, especially as given to someone in authority. A directing of motion or position of something to guide and to help and to push forward in a manner to solve an existing concern. I like that in the Holy Spirit too. He does that for us, doesn't he? A strengthener. To make stronger. To strengthen, enable, or encourage a person to act more vigorously or effectively. A strengthener. We cannot, cannot forget about that. And the last word, standby. That may seem simple. Readiness for duty and immediate deployment. A state of waiting to secure a, a, an, or to reserve a place for a journey. A person waiting to secure a place on standby. A person or thing that is ready to be deployed immediately if needed as a backup or an emergency or just ready for operation. I love that about the Holy Spirit too. So that means even in our depressive state, even in all the states that we are from everything that I've read to you of what is clinically decided upon to be what depression is. And I'm sure y'all can agree with this. Can you imagine the Holy Spirit is there as a helper, a comforter, an advocate, an intercessor, a counselor, a strengthener. And more importantly, he's at the ready. I forgot that. He's at the ready to defend and to deploy to help you help me help us. Move forward in our depression. And more importantly than that, a counselor. Someone who's digging deep into what the root of the problem is. And let's address it. Someone who's advocating. When you're sitting there trying to, when he's up there healing you. And getting you prepared. for, And getting you to understand what the root issue is. He's still advocate. He's still basically and, and, and spiritually as well as publicly speaking on your behalf that this person is worth having in the situation that you're going to be calling for. An intercessor in the sense of always being there to intervene at the worst of times when we can't do it for ourselves. He's constantly intervening on our behalf. He's strengthening our resolve in the face of this root issue. He's strengthening us to be able to walk together with Christ, walk into God's purpose with this ability that we've been given let's not forget we are in a fragile state a precious treasure in a clay jar the body may be frail but the spirit is willing but we have a holy spirit that can make sure that we don't break and we have a potter in christ has constantly molding us shaping us and preparing us for every good work we can forget in our depression that hope has never left us. But we have a Holy Spirit that God has given us by the pleading of Christ. It wasn't no, it, and it wasn't a thing to hand us the, 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 the Holy Spirit because he, we, he begged God because God didn't want to give it to us. That's not what I'm saying. He gave us the Holy Spirit so that we have a promise built into us. That God is who he says he is and will do what he says he will do. That confirmation that lives within us, that has created our body into a temple. We got to remind ourselves of daily. He will do it through our conscience. He will drive us and motivate us to go to his word. Like, I, like I've been motivated to come speak after so many a, a time in darkness. While I've gone dark and said nothing to you. Who's been supporting me even in my absence. Praying for me even in my absence. Even though I'm not out of the darkness, I see a light. I see you guys still participating. I see you guys still listening. I see you guys still praying 
And I realize that if you can go forward, I can go forward because you have carried me through your prayers and your consistency. I pray that this message reaches you who may be going through a depression, who may be going through adverse circumstances that are outright out. I mean, it's outmaneuvered you. It's weighed you down and hindered you from moving forward. I pray this message reaches you as much as it has touched me to talk about it, to talk about this truth. Now let's, Let's, th- then we talked about what depression is by society standards. We talked about what it looks like from a spiritual standpoint. We talked about the stigma that comes along with depression. But now we got to talk about what can uplift us. We got to talk about what that can uplift us. We got to talk about what is the combat things that we can get to to do these things. You have just listened to You in HD, your identity in Jesus Christ with Pastor Eric Miller. This ministry is made possible by your thoughtful prayers and donations. Join us each week as we continue to explore our Christian identity in Jesus Christ. May God richly bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. You have just listened to You in HD. Your identity in Jesus Christ with Pastor Eric Miller. This ministry is made possible by your thoughtful prayers and donations. Join us each week as we continue to explore our Christian identity in Jesus Christ. May God richly bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.